until the lions have their own historians tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter this is an often cited african proverb and it highlights that the interpretation of the history is subject to the predisposition of the individual writing the history and the battle of polachi is no exception was it the british prowess that earned them such a decisive victory in the battle of polachi or just a british storyline to gloss over the murky role they played here in india that's a huge question and will continue to evoke debates leaving enough room for our critical mind to think over the events i shall try to focus on some of these captivating issues in today's talk as usual this is jana sarwar and you are watching sarwar's chronicle Although the so-called Battle of Polachi took place on 23rd June 1757, but the sign of disintegration was unambiguously visible way before the crisis started. Emperor Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan successively ruled Mughal Empire for more than 100 years, and they collectively ruled near 102 years, starting from 1556 to 1658. the period was much more stable because of the military commanders like bairam khan munim khan muzaffar khan and others the decline in the quality of the rulers correspondingly impacted the quality of the military commanders and their addiction to wine money and omen further ruined them due to lack of success in law each time a ruler died there is to be a huge fight amongst the brothers and the ugliest one was when aurangzeb ascended to the throne killing his brothers darashiko and murad and sent shah shuza in exile to barma this has seriously damaged the cohesiveness and unity among the nobles during the akbar's reign he won over the non muslims because of his uh, um, liberal religious policies and also because of uh, equal job opportunities irrespective of caste creed and race the rat rajputs in particular acted as the pillars of the mughal empire and they have gone as far as central asia to fight in favor of the moguls but they turned out to be bitter foes of aurangzeb when he imposed or reinstituted jizya on the non muslims which was exempted by akbar in 16th century and besides aurangzeb made an unworthy attempt to execute the shi guru tej bahadur for refusing to convert into islam and that ultimately grew into enmity between them eventually the maratha jats sheik rajput they all went against the uh, mughal empire and ultimately contributed to the downfall of the moguls mughal army used to be recruited by the mansabs or the nobles instead of paying cash to the mansabdars they used to be allotted or issued with a tract of land known as jaigirs to extract revenue one part of which used to go to the state while other two part used were used uh, for personal expense and as well as to carry on with the expense for maintaining horses and soldiers the lack of direct contact between the mogul empire and the soldiers really reduced the authority of the moguls uh, which was particularly felt during any kind of invasions foreign invasions emperor shah jahan's fascination for construction also depleted lot of treasury Mm, from the Mughal Empire, particularly to name, um, the the cost of Taj Mahal alone was 32 uh, million Indian rupees in those days' money. There are a few geostrategic considerations as well, particularly while fighting raged in Europe and North America during the Seven Years' War, starting from uh, 1756 to 1763 between France and Britain. it also spilled over to their far away outposts in india, in india making it a truly global in nature in asserting their power both side built their units and also recruited uh, local personals particularly the government of madras became impassioned because of the return of the armaments taken by admiral watson and lieutenant colonel clive in view of likely french attack french governor general joseph duple was uh, getting increasingly close to the Nawab scored in Mushidabad that made the British a bit nervous so the British 
they had something in mind as far as deciding upon the fate of the Bengal province. Now let us look at some of the obvious reasons, particularly the attack by Nawab Shiraj ud um, at Fort William was the most important reason besides the misuse of uh, export trade permit issued to the East India Company was being misused and that caused huge revenue, revenue loss to the Bengal state. Construction of fortification with mounted guns at Fort William was also another very serious reason. Besides, the company also um, allowed asylum to a political fugitive named Krishna Dash against the will of the Nawab and also the East India Company's preferential treatment to the merchants did not also go well with the Nawab. Ali Bordi Khan, the grandfather of Nawab Shiraj Dola, he never wanted to be a toy in the hands of the East India Company as they had been using their proxies in the South India to grind their axis. So the East India Company uh, planned to remove Ali Bordi Khan as early as 1752 but before they could execute the plan, Ali Bordi Khan died in April 1756. But before the death of the Nawab, he nominated uh, Nawab Shiraj Dola, the son of, a, of his youngest daughter, Amina Begum, as the next Nawab. But Nawab's eldest daughter, Ghoshiti Begum, had something else in her mind. She was planning to enthrone Shaukat Jong, the son of her second sister, Maimuna Begum, as the new Nawab. As Shiraj ascended to the throne, jeopardizing the uh, desire of Ghoshiti Begum, she instantly shook hand with Nawab's commander-in-chief, Mirzafur, who himself was nursing the ambition of becoming Nawab himself. When Nawab demanded 30 million rupees as uh, tribute from the bankers and was returned, that really um, caused a strained relation between the Nawab and the merchants group. Around the same time, the message of fortification in Fort William came into the knowledge of the Nawab. So, furious Nawab attacked Fort William on 20th June uh, 1756 and defeated the East India Company and also confined many. And it's learned that 123 out of 146 died out of suffocation. And this particular event is known as Black Hole Incident and especially the British writers. They termed this use as black hole incident and used it as a rightful um, uh, cause to take the revenge against the Bengalis. When the news of Calcutta attack reached the Madras, the Admiral Watson and particularly Lieutenant Colonel uh, Lord Clyde, they were sent with reinforcement. As they, they joined with as many as four ships and ultimately by February 1757, they were able to take over Calcutta. Yes, his secret sale was already working with, on the next succession plan with the support obtained from the palace insiders when Admiral Watson joined them and he also augmented the team. As the Cedia company uh, focused their attention to French posts at Chandanagar, the French elements there got alarmed and before they could bring in any reinforcement, the East India Company dislodged Chandranagar by March 1757. The Nawab, fearing the strong presence of English in Bengal, he started contacting with the French post based in South India, particularly in Pondicherry and Arcot. Besides, the Nawabs had other headaches like he had threats from Marathas in the west and Afghans from the north. Clive already made up his mind to remove the enfeebled Nawab and formed a confederacy comprising um, Jagat Shet, uh, Meir Jafar and Rai Durlop. These merchants from Rajasthan made them huge bankers and they were lending money to the Nawabs, to the Mughals and they were also lending money to the European companies. It is recorded that three out of every four rupees collected on account of revenue used to straight away go to the go to these merchants as against the advance they have already made to the nawabs 
They played the kind of role played by the Rothschild family during the Napoleonic War by financing the um, uh, British uh, during their wars in paying the subsidies uh, remitted to, the, uh, to their allies. At this stage, um, East India Company planned to have a treaty between Lord Clive and Mirjafur. During the negotiation stage, uh, the conspiracy to topple the Nawab ran with much suspicion before it was finally executed. Uh, Lord Clive uh, somehow came to know that the Omi Chan, the first, uh, the most important broker, he is ready to divulge the info information to Nawab at any cost. This would threaten the lives of Admiral Watson, Mirjafur and other conspirators, but Omi Chan was determined uh, to take the full benefit out of the situation and he wanted to dictate his own term. He even demanded 300,000 pounds and also 5% on all world proceeds for the secrecy and service he will provide. After finalizing the deed between the Mirjafur and Lord Clyde, uh, Omi Chand, he blackmailed the English saying, if he is not going to be paid accordingly, he will divulge everything to the Nawab. He even insisted that uh, one of his clause uh, reaffirming his share should be inserted in the deed and he would not sign it unless he has seen it by his own eye. Okay, Clive Mann being the clever man of the century, century he wanted to beat the Omichad in his own game, so he prepared two treatises, one in the white paper without the name of Omichan and the other one is in red paper with where Omichan's name was written. The first one being original and second one is uh, was fictitious. And accordingly, the treaty was signed on 5th June 1757 and nobody knew about this treaty except Lord Clive. In the committee, there was much suspicion but it was Lord Clive who assured that they should go ahead with the next plan and he even assured and went on to write to Watson that tell Mirjafur uh, that I am with him and I will march, I will join in the war with 5,000 people who never turn their back and I will be just beside him as long as there is one man alive. On the morning of 23 June 1757, both the forces concentrated on the bank of Bhagirathi River. The river flows north to south. Mushidabad is about 30 miles upstream. Calcutta is about 100 miles downstream. The battlefield derives its name from the Bengali flower Polash and is anglicized as much known Polashi, situated on the bank of Bhagirathi River and on the south of the Mango Group. Lord Clive's forces comprised of uh, 950 European soldiers, 2100 local soldiers, 100 um, gunners, um, 50 um, sailors and 8 cannons. After crossing Bhagirathi River, the Lord Clive's forces, they occupied position uh, in, in the, along the perimeter facing north and northeastern side of the Mango Group behind the, um, behind the Arden Bank uh, so as to get cover from artillery or any counter-attack from the opposing sides and uh, while deploying the European soldiers were in center keeping the local soldiers on the right and left and they also positioned their artillery between the English and the local soldiers and some of the artillery pieces were also sent forward and Lord Clive he took a position on the top of Shiraz's hunting lodge situated behind the between the mango grove and the Bhagirathi river as you can see in this sketch. The Nawab's force comprised of 35,000 infantrymen, 15,000 um, horsemen and they also had 53 artillery pieces and 50 Frenchmen and infantry were um, equipped with uh, firelock, pike, um, swords and bows uh, to counter the enemy. Nawab's army deployed particularly uh, from in the in the area north of uh, Mango Group, about a kilometer away from the English forces, where Madan Mohan and Madan Lal they occupied their position around the river 
artillery under French Sintre took up position around the water tank in the center and he was also accompanied by local um, local artillery pieces which were uh, carried by cart and pulled by animals they were essentially slower than other artillery pieces that were that were there in the battle besides the nawab shiraj ud-daula he held his uh, organized his camps uh, back towards the north uh, in the battlefield and um, mir jafar raidur lob and um, yar lutif khan they were covering the north and eastern perimeter eastern perimeter to prevent any outflanking by the east india company at about 8 pm uh, when both the forces are positioned on the bank of bhagirathi river is the uh, east india company artillery that is started pounding signaling the start of the war initially the english artillery they were pounding very meticulously yet they have caused enormous losses on the part of the nawab's soldiers but by midday the heavy rain turned the tide in favor of the british the british artillery quickly managed to cover by using tarpaulin so as such uh, british artillery including their arsenals those could be protected from the uh, likely damage could be caused by the rain on the contrary there had been no such arrangement in the nawab's camp as such all the artillery pieces in the nawab's camp were put out of action so as the rain stopped nawab's camp thought the british artillery also have been put out of action as such they started charging on the british with fresh vigor and they soon met with withering impact of english artillery and started causing enormous loss the british guns had longer range and they as since they also retained their ammunitions so in the later half of the battle they have come with full might and they were using it to the fullest on the contrary uh, the nawab's artillery which were carried by the uh, cart pulled by the animals were unable to move on the slippery ground because these heavy artilleries were meant for static battles because in a moving battle you really need a uh, very very modern smart artillery where you can um, uh, ensure the delivery of the uh, ammunition much sharply than they used to so in that perspective the british artillery they took a better age over the um, artillery of the uh, nawab's artillery so british artillery in a way took the role of maximum attrition in this battle as such the traditional battle worthiness of the nawab's force really came to the drop however during the rain the animals were anxiously looking for shelter which was not in the site so all this created a lot of confusion in nawab's camp around this time nawab's poor french artillery were exhausted and um, english artillery came into action with full might this is when nawab's trusted general mir modon he got a splinter from the english artillery firing and after his martyrdom the next trusted general mir mohan lal he took over the charge mir mohan lal as it is or as always he was fighting bravely and he needed support from the cavalry fast fast moving cavalry which was not forthcoming in fact all the cavalry were mostly under the control of mir jafar and his generals and those were not forthcoming at this time nawab shiraj ud daula made a very desperate request to mir jafar so that he comes forward to help the bengal army or the bengal state to save its honor as of as mir jafar advised retreat so nawab shiraj ud daula lost not but at this point of point in time also 
Nawab Shirajuddaula was forcing that the battle should go on because anything less than continuing the battle would also demoralize the soldiers. So what he thought of that we should continue with the battle and finish it up, but Mir Jafar stayed firm on his suggestion. So under the situation, reluctant Mohan Lal, he returned to his camp at around 2 p.m. in the daytime. At this time, failing to convince Mir Jafar, Shiraj advanced for, adv um, ordered for withdrawal and ultimately there was huge hue and cry, rumors, uh, all those have gone against the uh, Nawab and also facilitated the aims and objectives of the Lord Clive and Mirja for Gong. Under the circumstances, the Nawab had to make a very um, cruel decision of leaving the battlefield to save his own life and eventually he leave Mushidabad the next day and while from traveling to uh, partner from Mushidabad, one of the English uh, agent or a beggar, he gave information of, of Nawab's presence there, following which Nawab was brought back to Mushidabad for execution. The native army lost nearly 500 lives in this battle and another 1,000 injured, while the British East India Company only lost 27 lives and all were represented by the local soldiers. I'm sure like many, you will also agree that the Polish battle can be at best be termed as a skirmishes, where Nawab Shiraj with 50,000 unskilled village boys were up against the walls one of the top military power of the day. Nawab deceitfully employed corruption and forgery to topple the, um, topple the Nawab and engineer the coup in connection with the um, emerging tycoons and the local elites of the Bengal region. This event heralded the crony capitalism on the soil of the Indian continent. Even more shocking was the Manifestation of the Bengali character is starting from the treacherous Mirjafar in the top to the Peristerian in the bottom, who had been curiously witnessing the Nawab's dead body being dishonored, kicked while he was being taken to Murshidabad without lending any support. These are the issues that we can think over and over again so that we can improve upon our self-esteem, otherwise as a nationality, we can never change ourselves for better and will continue to carry the stigma of Mirjafur starting from domestic household to statecraft. Certainly, Shirajuddala stood like a rock in the sea of mediocrity with his ignorance and arrogance. With this, I end my talk here. Thanks very much for watching. Goodbye and Allah Hafiz.